Okay. Can you hear me? Good. Uh, welcome, everyone. So we're doing this enhanced mic thing to get better audio quality on the videos because it was fading sometimes. So this should enhance it with the, the lighting that'll help enhance the speaker's glow. <laughs> Anyway, I just, uh, I just thought tonight, I mean, this, this group was founded in uh, 1978, believe it or not. You know, totally different era, but this makes 40 years for this nonprofit to be in existence, and that's, that's pretty amazing in a sense. The, um, the goal's always pretty much been the same, to help uh, inventors transition from a product to a business. We probably have a little more emphasis on the business side now, which is everything from funding and financing and manufacturing and social media marketing, all that, because that's the, the areas where people need the help the most. You know, getting getting a product and then getting your, your patent or trademark is pretty straightforward, but then a lot of people at that point get stuck and they don't make the transition to business because there's a lot of decisions you have to make and a lot of different things you have to do to make that happen. So anyway, um, for anybody new here, uh, if you haven't already disclosed your idea, be sure to keep it confidential. And, you, and if you have it disclosed, remember you have a, a one-year time window to get a patent application filed in the United States. Uh, foreign, you need to um, file before you disclose for absolute novelty, just to keep it basic. So anyway, um, see speakers coming up. We have um, Jim Horn coming up in two weeks. He's going to be talking about manufacturing and engineering. And then we're going to have, um, I haven't got it finalized yet, but uh, the director of the Denver Patent Office is coming in October, most likely. And then we're going to have a um, Securities and Exchange Jobs Act update in this November from John Eckstein. So this is the streamlining of uh, doing a public offering in a, a small scale and also uh, in an in-state scale. So it's less cost and it's, it's another way to raise money outside of Angels Ventures and, and doing Kickstarter or Indiegogo and that sort of thing. So always looking for ways to help people raise money. Um, so we'll go ahead and do a, a round robin. Everybody take about a minute and tell us what you got going on. So I'll start with Linda. Yeah, okay, well, my name is Linda, and this is the first time I've been here. This is the first time coming. So I'm a little bit nervous, <laughs> but um, I came out with uh, an apparatus for cats. Um, so I'm into animals. I love animals. And um, so, yeah, that's what I came up with. And I, I'm here because I need help with marketing. And um, I'm thinking about licensing my ideal. And so I just need some, some help <laughs> with that. Thank you. Hey everybody, I'm Scott. Um, I uh, will continue to work on my brand for uh, my apparel brand and um, I'm having fun doing that. I would like to find out if we have anybody coming soon regarding like um, Kickstarter type uh, programs. Um, so that might be something of interest um, by maybe others as well. But yeah, that'd be kind of cool. So um, yeah, so I was working on my apparel brand that has um, kind of So yeah, my apparel brand is kind of uh, meant to uh, inspire positive social change, and um, I'm excited about uh, the future of that. So. Uh, hi, my name's Sweet. I am uh, basically working on a game console stand. Um, so for you know, game consoles, PlayStation, Xbox. Um, yep, just uh, finishing up prototyping and you know, getting out to, to test. So. 
Hey, my name is James. I've been here several times. I just come to see what I can learn about all the various facets of this and getting things off the ground. I've, I've got a product that I'm working on, just getting ready to start doing some preliminary testing with it. I'm a nurse by trade right now, so that's me. Thanks. And I'm uh, Roberto Ruskena. I'm a patent agent. I've been practicing for 15 years now. Um, and uh, I'm the correspondent of a few Italian patent law firms, so I'm getting uh, application from uh, mostly from Europe, and I do the U.S. prosecution and filing of uh, U.S. patent application, and getting a U.S. patent for them. So that's what I'm doing. Okay, thanks. So our speaker tonight is Bonnie Kate. She was a uh, long-term mainstay. We both came in in, uh, I think, summer 99, eight, uh, almost 20 years. So Bonnie's been, I guess, semi-retired last few years. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, she was our marketing arm, and uh, so I was kind of the patent copyright with Roberto. But anyway, Bonnie uh, knows a lot about trade shows, and sooner or later, every inventor is going to be dealing with trade shows. <laughs> so. You're going to want to get the most out of it you can because it is an investment of some time and money and you want it to work for you. And so Bonnie's going to talk about that and be sure to ask questions anytime during the presentation that they come up. All right. Go ahead. Okay. I've been in marketing. 40 years. Um, started out with General Electric Company and then a uh, long career there and then opened a marketing agency specifically for inventors and new product launches. I've done consulting at the inventor level for up to the uh, large uh, $500 million co corporations uh, launching new products and then selling that corporation for $12.1 billion to a Swiss company based on the products that were developed. So I'm very familiar with the marketing process and how to take a product to market at, from a small pet product that went national in a month um, to you know, the large corporation. Um, I can tell you that when it comes to trade shows, and I'm going to try to focus right there because marketing is an enormous but with trade shows, you can count on this. You're going to have the highest highs you've ever experienced, and you're going to have a lower than a snake's belly experience. And they're going to come one right after the other with trade shows. So uh, buckle your seatbelt. <laughs> it's hard to tell. Usually it's the excitement, <laughs> um, but it just comes in waves. Uh, but trade shows are, are just so much fun to do. Um, and um, I'm, I gave you a handout. Normally, normally I would uh, do a PowerPoint presentation, but I really would like this to be interactive. Um, ask me questions, because this is just a, an outline, but I want to make sure that you have the facts in your hands uh, more than you would get in just a PowerPoint slide can't put a lot of information on there, right? Okay, so I started out with putting links on here. And there are links to multitudes of trade shows. There are many more than what are on here. And some of these sites are nonprofit and informational. And there are a couple of them that are very self-serving. So keep that in mind when you're looking at them um, as to what it is. You know, if it's not a .org, it's probably a commercial site, okay. um, and, uh, you know, but the articles like entrepreneur.com, entrepreneur is a magazine, and they publish articles, and so this is a direct link to an article about trade shows. So each of these have something that you ought to look at regarding trade shows, various opinions on them. Um, the Houston Inventors Association has their own trade show for inventors. And um, I believe people will come from other states to 
go to that as well. Uh, Roger, do you know if the Minnesota Inventors Group has a show every year anymore? I know they, they moved it. Mm -hmm. Minnesota Inventors, right. 3M started it, um, and they moved it to the Twin Cities area, and then more and more when the um, economy hit the skids, um, more and more of them kind of stopped having the show. Um, that's about the time that I decided to close the doors on my marketing, new product marketing business because we weren't launching new products, tightening the belt, waiting for it to blow over. So, um, anyway, that. Yeah, yeah. The, about 10, 8 to 10 years ago, um, I downsized, started laying people off, and, you know, we had to, you had to make changes. You know, it's old. And so I decided it was time to do a semi retirement in a different direction. But, um, you know, there's a lot of information in these. Um, one of the, the websites here, you'll notice it says Inc.com, Inc. Magazine published an article that Stephen Key wrote. Now, Stephen Key um, is very knowledgeable, but he makes his money on selling licensing instruction. So he sells enough of those little packages and licensing instructions that he really doesn't do much with inventing. So keep in mind what you're looking at when you go to these websites. But the article is good, so you know, just bear that in mind. When, when it comes to trade show, there, there are basically three types of trade shows. There are uh, inventor trade shows, there are consumer trade shows, and industry trade shows. And I've got those outlined on here where it says types of trade shows. Next to inventor trade show, I want you to put learn word learn. Next to consumer trade shows, put the word sell. This will help you remember these. And in industry trade shows, put the word connect. Because that's what you're going to be doing at these trade shows. And don't go in there with the mistaken idea that at an inventor trade show you're going to sell products. That doesn't happen. You're there usually because it's the first step in getting the feel of doing a trade show, talking to people, because a lot of times inventors are engineers, they're more technical people, they're very hands-on. You know, let's build something. They're not necessarily the extroverts. So learning how to talk to people in a trade show environment is important. Um, when you go to an inventor trade show, one of the very first things you need to be aware of is intellectual property. Because there are people that will go to these inventor trade shows, they don't tell you who they are, and they're simply looking for products to copy. So you want to make sure that you're either provisional or you've got a filed patent or patent pending. A provisional is an application, it's not a patent. And that gets mixed up all the time. But I want to tell you something, when you're at these trade shows, do not tell them what you have. You don't say, I've got a provisional application on file. Don't say, I've got a patent. And why? Because if I am looking for a product to copy or to tweak and make it my own, I want to know it's a provisional. Because over 90% of provisional applications never mature to a full patent. And that happens in less than a year. So, if I wait nine months, 11 months, and I go make a product, and you haven't filed, you're one of those 90 some percent, I've got a product. So, don't fool yourself into thinking that just because you have a provisional on file, you are completely protected. Just know that it's gone if you don't file that full patent. And a, a good attorney or patent agent will tell you that. That doesn't mean don't get it, because a lot of times a provisional helps you get it out there. 
you know, if you go to an event or a trade show or any trade show, you want at least the provisional in place so that you can go. You may go to that trade show and find out this isn't worth pursuing. And that's okay too. Um, it's, it's a good practice for the industry trade shows because that's really, really where the money lies, industry trade show. It takes a lot of the delusions that inventors have away. They think they go to an inventor's trade show and somebody's going to come up and they're going to license their product. That's the dream of every inventor. The chances of you getting a license on your provisional application or even a patent pending product are minuscule at best. Um, there is a lower cost of doing it, going to these inventor shows. And now they're doing some com combination of things with inventor shows in that large trade show, industry trade shows now are putting little areas in with lower cost for inventors to show their product. And that can be a real plus for you, bigger than you ever imagined. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Now on the consumer trade show, this is a selling opportunity. These are the holiday trade shows. They tend to be regional, local. Um, I had an inventor who um, and I usually recommend that if it's a consumer product, start small. Start manufacturing your own, even if you have to do it in the garage. Go to one of these trade shows and sell some. Get some feedback. What do people think? Are they selling like crazy or are you sitting there and nobody's even bothering? Or they're not asking you questions. That's a very low cost way of getting yourself in front of people and getting some feedback. Is to go to one of these, you know, consumer trade shows if it's a consumer product. If you've got some that you can make and they look decent and people will try them. Of course, somebody else is going to talk to you probably about insurance risk. If it's a child's product, uh, there may be some danger in that. So make sure you talk to your patent attorney and uh, find out what, what that's about. If you have a, uh, from experience, I can tell you if it's a children's product, unless you have a a lot of money. A lot of money. You probably don't want to spend it. Insurance alone will kill you. And the testing that's required is beyond comprehension. I had one inventor quoted $100,000 just to do a safety test on her product. Yeah. Went into automobiles. So, um, like I said, the consumer trade shows are good for that, per, you know, for the purpose that they're there for and can be really helpful if it's a product that you can make a few of and put out there and you, you've got some protection. Try it out. The worst thing you can do is go get tons of them manufactured and have your garage full and know where to put them. The, um, there's an inventor who created a Stair climbing dolly that won the invention of the year at the Minnesota Trade Show. He had invested. Hmm? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, no more. I, yeah, I hadn't either, but I've, you know, I've been a little bit removed from the, the mainstream and the inventors lately. But um, this particular product, um, I saw it in the trade show. This is great. Do you remember seeing it? You would, I know you went to some of those. A couple guys that did it, and they were so excited because they won Best of Show. What happened to them is they had invested over $100,000 mortgage on his house to do it, manufactured these things, had them in a warehouse that he was paying rent on, and um, somebody else already had that product on the market. And he even had a patent, but his patent was done by the people who do the IPAC show. 
and it, it was a very weak, they put a provisional on it instead of a, uh, a full patent. And the fact they had a provisional and, um, and wait a minute, excuse me, I'm sorry, wasn't a provisional, it was a design patent design patent on it instead of a full patent. And so the fact that he had it in the show exposed it, eliminated him from getting a full patent. Somebody else was already on the market with a similar one. And so he lost his house. He ended up going through a divorce and the warehouse full of this product that could go nowhere. It was overbuilt. So those are some of the hard lessons that people can learn in this, you know, doing inventing a product. So get with somebody who really knows what they're doing. Get with a reputable patent attorney or patent agent. You've got two of them right here that have a lot of success under their belt. So that's, it's really important to do that. You don't want to skimp on the intellectual property and then win best to show and lose your marriage, your house. <laughs> And, and I could tell you a few more horror stories like that, but that one is the worst that I that I can remember. Industry, well, let's see. Okay, uh, consumer trade shows are open to the public. You're there to sell products, get some experience in sales, and how you're going to go about doing that. Okay, um, industry trade shows, that's where the gold lies. But most of them, you don't go there to sell products. You go there to connect with people who take your product on, put your product in their inventory, are looking for products to manufacture, it's a connection point. But you want to be as prepared as you possibly can when you go to these shows. The industry trade shows are very, very expensive. A booth can be $5,000 on the low end up to 100000 or more depending on where it is, how big you want to put it, how big your company is. Um, so if they have an inventor's area, some of them, like the hardware show, um, the inventor's area, I don't know what it is now, but I know you could get a booth at that time. And really, it's not really a booth as such. It might be just a table. But it gives you the exposure. But that can be $1,000. And then you have your transportation costs your advertising, your connection, your pre-show, during show and post-show marketing. Um, so all of these things have to be figured in when you're planning to take, you know, to go for a show. But I would say minimum, minimum, you're looking at about 5,000 to, to 10, well, actually probably 10,000 or more to go to an industry trade show. Yeah, there are a lot of those. Yeah, we'll do it all for you. We'll, we'll mark it. We'll, yeah. No. No. If they, if they take it on a computer to the trade show, they've taken your product to the trade show. So the fine print in those contracts, you really need, you need to know what you're looking at. Because they've taken your product to the trade if they've got it on their website and they pull it up if they have somebody that happens to be by their booth. But they're primarily there to get people who have products to then buy into their system. That's the goal. It's not about selling your product or getting your product licensed. Licensing is, is to say it's a long shot would be over. Um. Yeah. It really depends on your budget. 
because if in, in an ideal world, I'd say have a prototype that actually works and you know what the cost is to manufacture them in volume. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And sometimes, um, you know, do, you have to know why you're going to that trade show. You know, if you're going to that industry trade show and you are protected, but you don't tell them whether it's a provisional or a full patent because it's none of their business, okay? And they don't, that way they don't know what you have to patent. They just know you've got something they might have an interest in. But you don't tell them what specific part of that product is patented. Because you may change that based upon what you hear at that trade show. I mean, that's what people do, right, Rebecca? You have a provisional and you find out there's a better way of making it, you're going to tweak that provisional and you get a new start date. So you want to do that right away. If you learn things at an industry trade show, then get together with your patent agent or patent attorney right after and say, look, this is what I learned. Let's see, am I covered if we do this to the, to the product? So if you are out, if you are strictly, if you're out of money, you have no way to invest in it, and you have it kind of semi-developed, you might want to take it to get some, some feedback to see if an investor or a manufacturer might want to take it on. Um, it, it's good feedback, but the further along you are, the more likely you are to have actual success. And that includes having it ready to be able to, at a show, even if you have a prototype, say, okay, I can deliver 10,000 of these to you in six weeks. Final product. And it be at this price for this volume. If you have that information available, even if it's a rough prototype and you've got the channel all set up, you're cooking. Because you're not going to sell them at that show, you're going to be following up anyway. So if somebody's really interested, that's when you're going to follow up with them and you're going to get more details about how interested are they really. Because you already have the numbers there, ready to go. If you're not prepared, if you stumble around and say, well, I don't know how much it's going to cost to make these, you know, maybe maybe $20 a unit, and they're calculating in their head, well, they don't really know what it's going to cost. When I look at that, it's going to be $50 a unit, consumer product times 10, better sell for 500 Oh, forget it. Mm-hmm. that's why I say the further along you are, the better, the better you are. But if your budget is totally limited, then at least know what it's going to cost to manufacture, how long it's going to take to get a small run, and, what, and then some of them will say, you know, if you're approached by Home Depot, they're going to ask you, when can you deliver $100,000? Yeah, so, you know, those and the numbers can happen. But just know that. Be able to know that. Um, it is, it is um, expensive to go to these industry trade shows. A lot of them are only once a year. So if you're thinking about going to an industry trade show, 
look at your timing, back it up. Because if you need to go to a trade show that is in September of this year, one, they probably have already sold out all the booths. The opportunity to, you know, may have already passed you by. You may be looking at a year and a half down the road. So really look at the trade shows and when they are, and then back that up. How, how fast do I need to get a prototype ready? How fast do I need to have the marketing materials ready? Do I have to have a finished product at that point? I need to get my pricing in line, my manufacturing in line, and all of that so that when you do get to the show, you can maximize the results that you get. Um, the highest value in, a, in an industry trade show is in the new product area. Don't pass it up just because you think it's extra. That is the number one place to go. Now, usually they won't let you put a product in there unless you're exhibiting. But the hardware show I know was allowing inventors who had the table booth to put a product in that new product uh, area. Now, here's why you need to do this. It's because people, when they go to these industry trade shows, they already know where they want to go. They, want, they know who they want to see. They've got a list because they're, they're time strapped. The very first place that all of them go is the product area because they all want to know what to do. And if you really look at the website thoroughly, you'll see options for getting, you know, getting noticed. And they'll include things like, oh, okay, here, put something in a ditty bag for everybody that it, that it can. Um, advertise in our show bulletin for, in our show bulletin. Uh, you know, they all want advertising dollars. You know, put up a big display, you know, whatever. Um, but the bottom line is, if you do nothing else, get in that new product area and look for it on every website for every show. Because they may miss your booth. Being a first time inventor, you may get back stuck in a corner someplace and not be seen. But if you're in that new product area, they're going to see you and they're going to follow up. Because that's the most exciting part of any show, the people that are looking for new products. And that's usually the people that come to see shows. They want something new to put in their stores or in their line or online or whatever they're doing. So don't miss that opportunity. Um, a lot of them are closed shows for the industry only. So that's why they don't sell anything there. And actually, they usually tell you you can't sell anything there. But it's kind of fun going to the shows because I usually go around and I find all these things that have out there in displays because they're showing them in displays how a retailer could show them. Um, and at the end of the show, and they're in a different state, guess what they do with all that product? They give it away or they sell it dirt cheap. They don't want to take it back. So that's kind of the fun thing about going to these shows. I have pets. I have a dog and I have two cats. So when I went to the pet show with this 10-year-old kid, launched his product for him. We had a blast. You know, I'm picking up pet products, all the new things that some of them never showed up in stores. But these big manufacturers made them. And some of them I loved. Another one was a, a PT show that I went for a physical therapist. And uh, I got uh, one of the original Theracates that actually is better than anything that they've got on the market that they cheapened up. And boy, it takes care of my headaches in a jiffy. So, uh, you know, there are things like that. They're just fun things at the show. And the excitement level is really high. So, and that's just kind of off the side, but it's fun. That's a good way to do it.
Perfect. And, and like I was saying, it brings up another point. Like I said earlier, some of these shows are they're only once a year. Well, if that once a year is in September, this is already August, get a ticket, go to that show, and learn. You know, you can get in the door, you know, see what else is there, who's, in, who's showing, how they're displaying their product, how far along are they, is there an inventor's area, just get a feel for that show. And you really understand then, okay, next year when I'm exhibiting, then this is, these are the things I need to know. And be sure to take copious notes. Because if you go back a year from now, you're not going to remember all this stuff. So take notes, take notes, take notes. And you can also meet people there and just, just meeting people. But be careful about taking exhibitors' time. Because their time is precious and they don't want to talk to you just to talk to you. So if, if an inventor came up to you and you were paying $5,000 for your booth, or even 1000 at an inventor's area, you don't want to be occupied with somebody who just wants to sit there. Right? So move on. Okay. Um, in the industry trade shows, um, Follow-up. I can't even tell you how bad it is. In that eight, over 80% of people who spend this outrageous sum of money never follow up. Mm -hmm. Pretty hard to believe in a way. I mean, here you've got these this golden opportunity and you can't pick up a telephone? Really? But you have to realize, too, that some of these big companies, they don't follow up because they're there to get their name out there, name recognition, get seen, um, the huge booths with tons of money. They're not there necessarily to sell because they have reps all over the country that are selling on their behalf. They're there because they need to make a presence. But still, to not follow up, to me, is just criminal <laughs> from a marketing perspective. Okay. Um, for all the shows, um, I want you to, to remember that you need to have a plan in place. Plan, plan, plan. You need a marketing strategy. You know, how do you plan to go forward with this product? How far can you go on what you have as funds to support it? And if you have to get funding, keep in mind that the further along you are, the more likely you are to get some kind of funding. If you've got a product that's ready to go to market and you just need funding to get it manufactured, you're more likely to get funding than somebody who has a patent and thinks they're looking for licenses. Life, help me, give me funds. I've heard this over and over. Help, give me some funds so I can go market my patent. You don't have anything. You have a right to make it that way, but it's no further than that. That's, it's a piece of paper. Yeah, you've got a driver's license, you don't have a car. Okay? I mean, that, you might look at it like that. What do you do with that? Okay? And I'm not... I'm not downplaying patenting, but it's probably about 8 to 10 percent of being successful with your product, if that. Um, let's see. Know why you're exhibiting. Are you going there because this is your last straw and you just want to look for a licensee? Are you going there to look for a manufacturer? Are you going there to find an outlet for the product to put it into? a retail store? Um, are you going to put it into, uh, does it need to be licensed to a manufacturer and you're there in the automotive industry and you need to get this product licensed because it goes as, it's part of a vehicle, like a windshield wiper? Okay. So know why you're going and then plan accordingly. Plan your presentation accordingly, plan who you're going to see, 
look at who's going to be there, and then decide from there who do you need to set up meetings with. And some of these have private meetings too, by the way. You can actually meet with you know, someone who represents a complete auto. They may be there, and they, they'll line up people who they're going to be talking to. And if you don't know that and you get to the show, it's too late. You need to register for those types of things before the show ever starts. Either the company or the trade show organizers usually, you know, they will set the appointments up. That's right. You, of course, a lot of times what you have to do is fill out some kind of information that says this is why I want to meet with them. It is. And the hardware show is one that does that. Yeah. But they can, the, the particular manufacturer may also say, no, I'm not interested in that. Blow you off. That's the chance you take. But hey, there's a chance. Okay? <laughs> Right. Yeah, and be prepared. Be prepared because there's a list of questions they're going to ask you. So you're going to need to know. Some of those I just mentioned earlier about how much does this cost to manufacture? Can I get 10,000 of them in six weeks? Okay, things like that. When can I get the initial, can I get them in releases? I can't make 10,000 of them in six weeks, but I can get you 5,000 of them in six weeks and another 5,000. Right, it really. So there are a lot of ways of looking at this. Don't think the door slams shut. Just look for for ways to get around. Them. Yes. Yeah. Now there was uh, one here in uh, Colorado. Um, they were had it every year. I can't remember the name of it, but it was. Uh, you might want to look on the internet for that type of a trade show. Uh, the best way to do it is like go to um, um, any of the societies, like um, I think it's IEEE for engineers. They're going to have a trade show. Um, people that uh, that do particular types of manufacturing will have a trade show for that particular area. It, it, it's it's incredible how many different varieties there are of trade shows for different industries. So don't just automatically assume that because your product's automotive like yours is, that you have to go to an automotive trade show. There may be a subset uh, that it would work for. Like if the product eventually will sell it at Ace Hardware, maybe you want to start with test at one of the Ace Hardware stores. You know, put a couple products in there and see how it goes. We did that with a pet product, put it in Ace Hardware. They flew off the shelf the first weekend because we got publicity. They couldn't keep them in stock. So then it started, more and more Ace Hardwares across the country start picking them up. Then you end up going to a regional show and then a national show. But you can't just jump sometimes to Ace Hardware, you can't anyway, to a regional or a national show until you have some success at a local store. And that means talking to the franchise owners of that store. Yes, Ace Hardware does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, the pet pet stores, um, they will go to the pet uh, manufacturers' trade show. There's a a national one. But um, if they see something they like, then what they'll do is they'll invite you to go to their corporate <coughs> headquarters, Arizona. California, I've been there, and uh, and then you sit down with them, and you've got 15 minutes, and you better be prepared, <laughs> and hope that you don't have a cat product and end up with a person who is a dog owner and ha hates cats. Okay, that happens. <laughs> that happened to me at Petco. <laughs> the product got into PetSmart, went bazonkers, but Petco wouldn't take it because the buyer didn't like dogs. It was bizarre. We all bring our personalities to our jobs, you know? 
and don't ever send product to them. Because if you ever go to one of the buyer's places, they have a room that is smaller than my master bathroom. <laughs> Seriously. It's like a little closet space. They don't, they don't want the product. They get trash canned if they come in the back door. All right. Um, when you, um, you know, planning for the trade show, plan for um, how, how quickly you can tell the story of your product. And there's a three second test. Can you say what this thing, how it benefits somebody in three seconds? If you can't, shorten it up. Because you don't have very long in front of these people. And about 80% of the time, you should be listening. 20% of the time, talk. So, and you have to listen to what they're saying, not what you're going to say next. And that's a tricky skill because most of us like to talk, especially about our product, our babies, right? Mm -hmm. um, you need to get their attention at a trade show. So when you do a booth, you want to do something that's going to get them excited. Now, let me give you a little story about the kids' product that I launched that got people's attention really fast. Um, they had a little strip of this artificial grass and they put it in front of the trade show booth just in the aisle. It just stuck out a little bit. Usually they don't like things in the aisle. And they were demonstrating the super scooper. So they were using chocolate candy bars with nuts in them. And they were on this little grass. Well, the family that I was working with and I was there with to help guide them with the show had a little daughter who was about, well, I want to say she was five, or she was under the table. She was reaching there and eating them. <laughs> so, <laughs> people were going crazy. And then you gotta go over there and see this little kid. She was eating all these candy bars. <laughs> it looked like dog food we were using as demonstration. <laughs> I got a lot of attention. And um, the kid ended up on the Today Show over the filming there, uh, which was fun. And they filmed part of the little girl eating the candy bars. <laughs> <laughs> but she was probably going to be very sick that night, I'm sure. <laughs> so, you know, there are a lot of things you can do to get attention. Um, I know somebody who knew that there weren't going to be water fountains near where they were. And so they had uh, a company, when they got there, deliver a big container of water, jugs of water, and they had cups there, so they had a lot of traffic because people were coming to get a drink at their booth. So there are little things that you can do um, to, you know, get attention to your booth. And sometimes that's balloons. Sometimes it's things hanging, fly, flyers that, that are above it. But look at the regulations because some of the trade shows won't let you do that. So just see what you can and can't do. And then get, put that creative hat on. Okay? What can I do to get people over there? And I've seen people walk around in costumes too, which is fun. Okay, uh, promotion, your time is, um, is very, very limited, um, and uh, so you want to get um, their attention. Like I said, most of the people that come there, about 76% of them, according to trade show statistics, have an agenda before they ever get there. And one of the things on their agenda is that new product <laughs> area. Um, but they also will have a list of the booths that they want to go to. So you have to figure out how you're going to get their attention to come over to your booth. And that may mean somebody's out on the floor in a costume or being crazy or who knows what. But you know, you've got to have some way to get them there. Um, making them aware that you're there before the show. And that can be done with um, uh, personal invitations. Cards. I've seen people send, uh, like, it's just a three by five card saying, you know, when they get the list of who's going to be attending the show or who, who attended last year, 
pick that list and you find out every one of those who you send a card to and say, we are going to be at booth 1050. Uh, visit us at the trade show for a free gift. Okay. Whatever that is. Um, you know, and the, my, you know, who knows? You just have to be creative with what that free gift is or a chance for uh, something that's really nice. I've, for a while there, people were giving away iPads. Yeah. Like somebody is, that visits my booth during this trade show is going to win an iPad. And you send out the card and you'll get traffic. Okay. But that, there, you just have to be creative. Okay. I don't think if you said you'll win a cat, if you come to my booth, <laughs> that will work. But. But, but free product sometimes does. You know, people want to try something new. That, that might work. Um, let's see. The trade show, you can increase the visits to your booth by about 33% under promotions in this list um, by doing pre-show promotion. And in order of um, priority or what brings the most people to the booth is the way I've listed it here from one through five. You know, why do they come to the show? What brings the attendee there? So, um, you know, how they, how they find out about it. So when you start looking at spending some real money there and you want to do promotion, look at that number one. Show producer direct mail, email, and website. Get on the website. If it costs you a little bit more, do it. And that also means registering for the show and getting your booth early. Because if you wait till the last minute to get your booth, even if you get a booth, you haven't had much time up on that website. And somebody who might be interested in your product may never have seen you. Go ahead. Two things. Were you, did you exhibit last year? Get you a better location. Okay. How much you spend gets a bigger, better location. Okay. Right. So you register early. There are certain booths in your price range. Okay. And you get to pick. So if you wait, you're going to be back by the restroom. Or your booth is going to be covered with a line to the food. Okay. So you want to avoid certain areas that, um, that are, at, on the surface, you're going to say, oh, there's a lot of traffic to the restroom. Everybody's got to go to the restroom, right? No, they want to go to the restroom. They don't want to visit your booth. They want to go to the restroom. <laughs> Same way with the food. So it's not necessarily the best place to be unless you are a food product and you're giving out samples. Okay, that's a different story. I don't know about the bath. Yeah. A hand sanitizer, maybe? I don't know. <laughs> maybe that's where you give out the hand sanitizers as a, a little, little, little bottle of it. Who knows? But, uh, but you better put your creative hat on there. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, generate traffic. We talked about personal invitations, uh, direct mail, uh, come by the booth, collect a gift, that kind of thing. Handouts. Don't spend a lot of money. As a matter of fact, a lot of people do these very fancy four-color flyers. In reality, they, the majority of them end up in the trash can before they even get out of the, the building. So. You want to make sure that you you get what you need, and that's to contact and talk to them, visit with them, and if they show interest in your product, then you pull something out from below and hand it to them personally, exchange it for a business card or their contact information. If it's a higher end brochure, some people just put out one sheet flyers with all their their color displays but nothing that you give away that's very expensive. That makes sense. So running off black and white copies is pretty easy. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I've seen people who will, um, you know, that you can get these for about a hundred dollars. Now oh, maybe they're more now. Under two hundred anyway. These six foot uh, banners that are on a, a pole, uh, or yeah, a pole holds it up, and it's it's four color print, and it comes in a like a aluminum case that's a stand. So you take the stand, you open the pop up, grab the thing, and you take the pole and it extends. Yeah, like a projector screen. Only it's probably, well, you can get them wide as you want, but you can get one this wide and put it up six foot and put it behind your booth. Or you can do two or three of them and make them, you know, get your graphics all together and for probably, well, let's see, if you had three of them behind your, your booth or your table, uh, just be aware if you've got a table in front of it, how much is going to get covered up. Um, you could probably do that for $600. And those you could probably take from your plane, bundle it up in a big duffel or something, and protect it. Now, there's some really fancy ones. I get it. I mean, oh, it has. It really has. And you can get a graphic designer to do your graphics on it. And uh, FedEx, uh, any of the FedEx stores have these things, and they'll just print them for you in no time. Mm -hmm. yep, ship it out. So there, there are lots of options that you can keep the cost down on. Furnishing the booth. Uh, be cautious about these industry trade shows if there's a union involved. Because sometimes they won't even let you bring your waste back. Okay. And the cost of a TV to run a loop is going to cost you as much as going out to the store and buying a TV. And you can't bring. So. So be very, very careful about what what they're offering and what you can and can't bring. Um, and some of the, the, them will, will require you to ship everything for your booth in advance. And then they will actually set up the booth for you. You can't do it because of the labor law. That they will have it set up for you when you arrive. So all these little idiosyncrasies about each trade show, and everyone's different. So you know, just look and look at the regulations and what they require before you actually go. Um, and usually they're up there from the previous year, and they just tweak a little bit for the next year. Okay. How are we doing in time? I know I'm. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. So um, people, I put a little attachment on here. And I want you to read that when you go home, read over this, because if you're guilty of any of these things with your spouse, your roommate, your friends, learn to train yourself, because it will get in your way at a trade show. You don't want to talk over other people, uh, talk less, listen more, ask questions. Uh, and everything that, that somebody says shouldn't remind you of a story that you need to tell. Now, all of these things on here are really important. And they will not only annoy your friends, they'll also irritate prospects and visitors to your booth. Now, when you're showing at your booth, people, important. Remember, when you're at a trade show booth, you're going to be there for a lot of hours. You're going to need a bathroom break. You're going to need to eat. Some trade shows have relief people that you can buy. They'll man your booth for a little while. Usually they don't know anything about your product, but at least they're there to protect whatever it is you have. 
okay? And, and a lot of times they're, they're high school or college students, but, but they'll be there. But uh, the best thing is to have a friend of yours or a wife or a you know, husband or whatever friend to go with you um, to help you out so they know a little bit about your product and you can explain it. But you want to train them beforehand as well. The worst thing you can do is have two people that are exactly alike at a booth. In other words, you don't want two engineers who all they want to talk about is the, the nitty gritty little details of the product and the person is really about marketing it. And so the best combination is somebody who's a technical part person and somebody who's comfortable with people and talk to people. So whichever role you are, it doesn't matter. Just make that trade show work for you. And I knew as James had mentioned earlier something about what about Shark Tank? Well, think about Shark Tank as a TV show. What do they want? They want people that are going to be entertainers, right? I have seen people who have tried out for that show who have incredible problems. But they're engineers. They don't come across well on TV. Most of them are introverts. You know, they're not going to be entertainers. And nobody can laugh at their product. It's a serious product. Okay? So, and they're not going to make a fool of themselves because that's something engineers don't do. Okay? So, it's entertainment. And even the ones that get accepted on Shark Tank end up not getting funded. It is an extremely rare product that gets any funding. And the inventor goes away anyway. They, you, you're the maverick. You're not the, the entrepreneur. So eventually you're going to go away. And sometimes that's okay. I mean, I'd rather have 1% of Microsoft than 95% of the business, biggest business in Colorado. Let's face it. You know, a small percentage is better than nothing. So don't be afraid to give up something. Most inventors want to hang on to it. They want to control it. And that's not necessarily in your best interest. Um, let's see. What else can I say about it? The attendees are going to be diverse. Um, you're going to find that some of them will be engineers if you've got an engineer product. And they're going to want the details. So being fluffy and asking them about their dog is not going to be the answer. They want to know the nitty-gritty of the product, so be prepared. Have the details there, be friendly to start with, to find out what it is their interest is in the product. Sometimes you'll start talking as if the person is a potential licensee or a potential manufacturer, and next thing you find out, they're a competitor, they're a booth two, two booths down, um, you know, it might be the janitor who's coming around them to the waste baskets and you think he's a prospect. So really find out what that person's interest is in your booth and your product. And I did put on here, you'll notice H on here. This is the go away statement that you're going to need because there's always somebody that wants to sit at your booth and talk your leg off. Uh, I appreciate you stopping at our booth. From our conversation, it doesn't appear that we can really be of service to you this time. If your situation changes, you have free field to contact me. Here's my card. And then move away. Okay? And I think, I hate to be stereotypical, but I think women tend to be, try to be overly nice. And they don't want to offend. Where a guy will be the opposite and hit somebody off, excuse the expression, and then you know, it can cause more problems. You don't want to cause a scene either. So just being straight to the point, matter of fact. Um, let's see. Be sure you train your help. And uh, visitors will only wait, you know, 58% will wait one minute or less. So there are usually waves of people coming to your booth. And so most of them will wait a minute or, or less. But not many at all wait more than five. They have to be pretty serious about why they're there. 
So you want to make sure that you've got a, uh, an elevator pitch or something that entices people in, and you give them the information and move, get their information and move them on so that you can take care of everybody that's there. Um, after the show, this is one of the most important parts of the entire trade show, is the follow-up. Like I said, over 80% don't follow up. And to me, that is that's shooting yourself in the foot. I mean, why'd you go to fir in the first place? You're there to make contact. Maybe it wasn't the exact contact you thought of. Maybe it's a manufacturer and you've already got your manufacturer in place. That manufacturer knows who's in complete auto with their product. They may have information that, that you need. So don't just, you know, just blow them off. Uh, but follow up anyway. But in part of that follow up, um, one is right away, not two weeks from now, but right away, as soon as you get home, take all those leads and send them a thank you for visiting my booth. And I will be in contact with you in the next one to two weeks. Don't make it go past two weeks. Get on that phone. You've got a lot of work to do when you get home from a trade show. Don't underestimate how much you've got to do. That's really important. Um, and when you get those prospects, you're going to have some organized way of collecting those at the show. I don't care whether you do it on 3x5 cards and a stapler to their business cards or the 3x5 cards. Make notes about them. Um, you know, this, uh, this lady, uh, very, very attractive, hey, short skirt, you know, really cute, uh, came by my booth. Uh, or, or, you know, th this guy, uh, manufacturer, uh, you know, probably in his 60s, gray hair, glasses. But put something on there that helps you remember who that person was and what they want, what their interest was. Because when you get home and you have 50 cards, you're not going to remember one from another. You're just not. So make some notes. Sometimes you can do it on a card, and other times I, I prefer stapling them to something, a sheet of paper, um, three by five card, whatever, with my notes on it. So when you get back, you know how to address it. And boy, they're really impressed if you say, hey, you know, saw you at the trade show. Um, I see you were at another booth, uh, such and such uh, near me, you had, uh, you know, the, the water there. Um, thank you for bringing one for me. You know, whatever it is that makes that person special, and you can say something unique about that individual. And, and that doesn't mean, hey, you're, you're a really good-looking guy. Are you, you available after? You know, no, that's not what we're there for. Okay? <laughs> um, grade the prospect. Because when you get home, you're going to look at those, and you're going to say, OK, who's, what's, what's my priority? You know, who should I be talking to first? And sometimes that's the night that you get those. Let's say the trade show is two days. First day, you go back to your room. You take all those cards. And if you do nothing else, on the little card that's stapled to their business card, you write A. That tells me I've got to follow up with this person immediately when I get home. This is an opportunity I can't pass up. D. Yeah, if, if I don't ever get to them, no big deal. So you want to grade them according to your priority as to what you need to follow up on. And do it quickly. Um, let's see. Um, then when you start going through these and you go through that A list, sometimes they'll move down to D or they go trash can. <laughs> Just depends. But, but prepare what you want to say, a brief introduction, um, what the need or interest is in, in the product, ask them that. Um, ask them what their decision-making process is and what's the next action to be taken. And I put these down here. Of course, you can elaborate. But these are key things that you want to try to get focused in. You may contact this person. They may say, well, you know, I don't, I don't make those decisions. But, but here's a name for Jody Smith. And she's going to review all the products in that category. Fine. Got another name? Yes.
those lists are fantastic. And if you exhibit at a show, you're going to get a list. So make sure you get one. And get one ASAP, because sometimes they'll win. Yeah. There are little ins and outs like that. And each show is a little bit different, but it's well worth your time. I mean, that list, that's gold for you, isn't it? no-brainer. Those, those are the kind of things you go, oh, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, telephone qualify as soon as possible. And then, um, I guess, wrapping it up, um, this, is, this little list right here is very important both personally as well as uh, at a trade show. So I'll just open it up for questions. If any of you have any questions or want to discuss your particular situation or where you're at or anything like that, I'd be happy to answer. Sure, Lynn. <laughs> that is, um, sometimes some shows. Right. I've also seen situations when you're talking about pet, pet products, that's yours, Linda, um, where a particular pet distributor allowed a, an inventor who had a pet product show their product in their booth because they wanted to see what the reaction was before they took it on. So, yeah. So it could save you money there in that you don't even have to buy the booth if you can get somebody that that's interested, say, look, let me, let me tag along. Can I go to your booth? Um, you know, will you let me have my materials there? And if it goes well, will you seriously consider taking it, taking it on? And then, boy, you better be prepared. Okay. So there, just think you just have to put that little creative hat on it. You know, find a way where there doesn't seem to be one. Oh, they're, they're ungodly expensive. Yeah, we had a lot of money. Yeah, we had uh, a bicycle product that went on the top of the vehicle. Complete, not taking the front wheel off. This was before they had other ways of doing it. And the uh, inventor of that product took a van and decorated the entire van with the graphics that we created for them. So all the way out to the show in Las Vegas, as well as while it was parked, and every time they went out to, to eat or to, to their hotel, 
anywhere if they were a walk, you know, a, a driving billboard. So, you know, there are ways of doing it that Actually, the impact show was the biggest. Yeah, yeah. But they were. Well, the problem with the inventor shows is that they're in a dozen different industries. Right here, automotive, gaming, wedding, tech. I had a product too I brought to market with a partner, with a plant product, totally different too. So right here, everyone here is a different product. Now if we all go to the same trade show, what are the chances any of us can find the people we need? <laughs> Training. No. And that's another no no. Don't spend too much time talking to the booth people next to you. Well, think about wh why you want to go. Why would you? Why would you want to go? And there, when, when, if I went to a meetup and I had a product, and games are kind of unique, you know, with, with, as far as intellectual property, I mean, how would you guys, how would you protect that well, going to an open meetup? And um, have you talked to a patent attorney about the function, functionality of that, and if there's something that can be protected in any way? Um, I just, I just saw what the program is going on right now. Um, okay. But I haven't, I haven't really sat down for a non-traditional and gone over everything. Because that's part of the reason I did the traditional. I just wanted to make sure that it was just the, the mechanism for actually the attachment.
the only the only concern I would have, and I'm being overprotective, is you're going to a location with people there that are in that industry and your exposure. Well, either a trade show or even a meetup with other people that are doing gaming products. Um, I would be very cautious, very cautious. Yes, we we uh, we had um, a member from that group here once that copied an adventure product and put it on the market, and also um, a member of that group violated a disclosure agreement, and this was years ago. And I won't use names, but I would be very cautious. And if you're and think of it this way: if you if you are struggling with getting the financing to go to the next step, and you go into a shark tank, you're gonna get bit. Well, and mm -hmm. yeah, and most most manufacturers are like that too. Most retailers, they're not going to invest in your product. If you don't invest in your product, they will, and then hope you have a provisional patent, and it's going to go away in a year anyway. So, you know, I mean, you know, I hate to be the bearer of doom and gloom, but I've been down this road with too many inventors, and even an inventor who had national distribution on their product, paid off a second mortgage on their house, made a lot of money on the product, two years before the patent expired, the retailer went around him and he had it manufactured in China. Two years, with how fast do you think you're going to sue somebody? So, it's, when I say Shark Tank, I don't mean the show Shark Tank. I think I say you're going in, yeah. you're jumping head first into a tank of sharks, okay? <laughs> so if you don't have that protective cage around you, you're going to get bit because somebody's going to smell vulnerability. SOL, unless you want to spend a lot of money. So what they did is they, they withdrew it from the store, they put it online, and they're still selling the product they sell it online from their own website. So, you know, this is life. You know, this is a journey. You're going to learn every step that you take. And learning here will prevent you from making some mistake that you might not have avoided by coming here and learning more from people who have been there and done that and, and 
have the scars to show for it, the successes to show for it. So don't give up, but just be cautious. It's like the guy with the, the stair climbing uh, dolly. Um, you really need to plan how you're spending your money, where, so you don't get taken. I mean, I, I had a couple women come to me and they went to a big law firm downtown and did their patenting rather than guys like this. The law firm took $25,000 from them to patent it in other countries and, and uh, all kinds of stuff. And, and they ended up, they came to me and wanted marketing, and I said, you, can't help me. you don't have any money. You know, your biggest part of the journey is ahead of you. The money was gone. So don't spend it all in one area, whether that's manufacturing, that's patenting, or marketing before you have a product ready, or you know, putting up fancy websites when you don't need them. You know, they're, they're un that unbalanced way of proceeding without plan is what's going to bite you. Did I answer enough questions here? <laughs> Hopefully you learned something. <laughs> Oh, uh, impact has stopped doing inventor shots. Mm -hmm. Inventor help. You know, they're behind the impact show for inventors annually in Philadelphia. They're not doing it in 2018. They're changing their entire direction, they say, to education. Yeah. Educating inventors. I'll be, it'll be curious to see how how they do. I don't know what they're going to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they're owned by the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've seen them. Yeah, the guy with the, uh, the dolly that climbs stairs, and I told you got a design patent, that came from them. Mm -hmm. Ruined his chances to get a... Uh, full patent ruined his chance, ruined his marriage. <laughs> so, you know, um, that's why coming to a reputable organization like this, patent attorneys that and patent agents that know what they're doing, they've been down this road, they've been here for years and years and heard these stories over and over. They can probably tell you some of the stories I've presented to them in the past. Um, you know, it's it's well worth it for you. If it sounds too good to be true, they're going to do patent it, they're going to market it, they're going to build a prototype. Yeah. It's going to cost you ten to twenty thousand dollars, but we're going to do all this for you. And if I send a blind letter to fifty manufacturers and I include a drawing of yours with my advertisement on the front, I've marketed your product. And I'll send you a letter every month saying I marketed to 50 companies and got no response. Keep paying me. If anybody says they can do it all for you, a lot of them out there that do, run. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Exactly. It is a good question.
It, it depends on the product. It really, yeah, yeah. I mean, there was, a, I bet, because <laughs> I'm an easy sell, and people who are in sales or marketing are easy sales sometimes. You see something that presented really well. Um, and this, this happened to be a, uh, a replacement for uh, saran wrap or plastic, because we're, everybody's trying, well, not everybody, those who are conscious about the environment are reducing as much as they can the use of disposable plastic. I don't, other than coming here like this and this is in a bottle, I don't drink water in these things. Um, I'll bring my own bottle most places I go. So anyway, uh, I was on probably Facebook or Instagram, um, and there was an ad that came across, and it was coming across, I probably saw it three times, and it was for these covers that were reusable, like saran wrap, only you could rinse them off and you put them on top of your bowls, and you know, great. I mean, it clung to the bowls. They're actually, it's actually a great product. It's made out of linen and waxes, but they're, you know, you can use them over and over. So I, I bit, I bought some. Well, I didn't think about the fact you can't see through it. That was the only downside that I could see to it, is I can't tell what's in it. So I'd end up having stuff going in my refrigerator bag because it lapped over the sides too much, the one, you know, the size I'd put on it. So it went bad, and I, because I couldn't see what was in it. So it's these little things that sometimes you don't see, but but they put that on the internet and they sold everybody. I mean, they are selling like crazy. Yeah. It was, it was uh, one of these sponsored ads that come up in Facebook every once in a while or Instagram, because I, I, I'm also a master gardener for Jefferson County, and so I'm on their Instagram team, and we rotate every six weeks, so I've got a week of postings on Instagram. And so I, when I'm posting, a lot of times I'll see these things you know, on there constantly at that time. And, and that was probably one of my thoughts. Is Remember the three? Okay. Well, it, yeah, it depends on the product. But remember the three types of trade show. Okay? The inventor trade show, you're never going to make any money. Okay? Do their education. Okay? The um, consumer trade show, if you break even, you're going to be lucky. So think of that as research. Correct. It's purely selling. Mm hmm. Holiday show down at the convention center. You're getting exposure. You'll make some sales. But if, if you cover the cost of that show, you're lucky. In industry trade shows, you don't make money there. You make money afterwards with the follow-up. Okay, so it's about connections. Remember the word connection. Okay. Right. So. Yeah, but think about it in that way. Some of them are, right? Okay, here's what I would do as a marketer and what I have done to clients. If you contact the trade show itself and you ask how many people would typically go to that trade show, and then cut that in half. <laughs> okay. um, then what you do is you look at the list of who exhibited at that trade show last year. Look them up.
be careful about spending too much time after the show picking your brain. Say, can I take you for coffee next week? Then you're going to get some real answers. Exactly. That's, that is the most reliable information you're going to get is right there. Not from the show. One show that we went to was a holiday show. This was downtown. I can't remember exactly where it was. It was in one of the big audiences. But unfortunately, they didn't realize that there was a big parade going on that same weekend. No parking. They had to park far away and walk. The attendance was a fraction, just a fraction. That's right. It's really, really a long time. It's hard to know. And like I said, the most accurate data is going to come from exhibitors from the three each year. It's a lot of work, but they do make money. And if it's an art item and you go to something like the Cherry Creek Art Festival, of course the fee to get in is enormous, and, and there's a competition. They take people from all over the country, so it's very, very selective. But all of these things that you think might be a good one for you may or may not be. It's, it's a lot of research involved. And then there are shows where it might be an automotive show, and you've got a pet product, okay? And you've got, uh, you manufactured a bunch of them. People that go to automotive shows, RV shows, so you have product to sell, you get a little booth because you're not in the industry, and you sell the heck out of it. And they're consumers. That's right. Mm -hmm. Well, if it's, if it's an industry pet show, you're not there to sell. Yeah. So, you know, you're not getting it. But if you go to the car, you go to an RV show, and you've got a pet product, you know, if I was Linda, I'd start manufacturing those. I don't know what it is, okay? But whatever it is, I'd start manufacturing those fuckers, and I'd find another inventor or somebody who has a product out there and buy them at wholesale and add them to your product line, okay? Then you go to the show and you have several products available. You're making money on all of them, including yours. You end up being a distributor of that of, of products in that line. Yeah. I do. I need an extra step when he gets down out of the RV because it's a big step for him. So, you know, 
there are a lot of things you, you, you've got to think outside the box, you know, and uh, so. Oh my God. Well, and, that, and that's interesting you mentioned photos because my vet's office, goes back to Linda, has uh, some artist that does chalk paintings of pets with their names on it, and every one of them is very artistically done, beautiful. But, I mean, my God, you could, you could have that artist at your booth and show pictures and get a percentage of his sale because he's sharing the booth with you with these pet products and custom pictures. I mean, they keep thinking outside the box. But that, you know, see, one thing will lead right into another. And You put a turnkey solution there for people. I mean, that's the way to think about inventing, is looking at how you can leverage that to make an income for you. Right? And, and like even James, with an automotive product. Okay. Can you find other people with automotive products that may not have your marketing ability? So you bring all these products together, and all of a sudden you have a product line. And guess what? The automotive stores are going to be more interested in talking to you because they don't like single product suppliers. You become a distributor of whatever that niche is. Time for us to go home? Okay. Can we let me go now? You're welcome. <laughs>